Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Give us a call. The number is 208-991-4783. And become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. Well, today's episode is brought to you by the financial support of our listeners. Thank you so much for all of your support. And it's time now for another episode of Crime on the Waterfront. This is really rare to find uh, two auditions for the same show, and I, I think that speaks to how much promise uh, Mike Wallace showed uh, in this particular role. So uh, let's go ahead and we will take a listen to uh, the episode, this one, uh, titled Eris Cruise, uh, and it was recorded on March the 1st of 1949. Waterfront, Kegel calling. The National Broadcasting Company presents Lou Cagle, ace New York detective, fighter of crime on the waterfront. Last Friday, the Metropolitan Art Museum requested headquarters to furnish someone who'd like to take a short boat ride. Seems a few of their highly valued paintings were slated to be put on exhibition at a kind of international go-to being held down in Bermuda, and they wanted a man to come on along and see that nothing happened to the stuff. So I went to Bermuda, and it's a pretty little island. I liked it. Oh, there wasn't much to do. Played some golf. Got into the water once or twice. Anyway, last night ended the convention, vacation or whatever, and this morning I checked aboard the Promethean for the return trip to New York. We're out of port about an hour when a steward knocks on my door and says, Captain Archer presents his compliments and would like to see me in his cabin at my very earliest convenience, which means pronto, so I go right down. Lieutenant Cagle, I'll come straight to the point. As master of this ship, I'm directly responsible for the safety of my passengers. Well, this morning, one of them, a young lady, appealed to me for protection. Against what? Kidnapping. On a ship? Almost my exact words. But here's the difficulty. The young lady is not just any young lady. She's Helena Dawson. Well, happy Easter. Name doesn't do anything for you? Dawson? Oyster Bay? Oh, wait a minute. The soap chips. And the oil. Sure, oil. sure. I see what you mean. Exactly. So in view of that, and uh, now I'm thinking as an employee of the line... To ignore the appeal would be unwise. Uh, but crank stuff, huh? Uh, I wish I could be certain. You think she isn't a crank? Now, this girl's not a run-of-the-mill heiress. In fact, she may never get a penny from her family. Well, what's the problem there? About eight or nine years ago, she broke with them. Oh, now, wait a minute. I'm getting it back. Uh, wasn't she the girl who walked out the night of her debut? And left the country. That's the one. Oh, Helena Dawson. Sure, I remember now. That was big stuff. What happened to her? She came to Bermuda and took a job as a teacher. From what I can gather, she's been on her own ever since. Well, now tell me how the kidnapping scare works in. Yes. Well, she says it started two weeks ago in Bermuda when an anonymous phone call came. Seems a man at the other end of the line instructed her to leave $10,000 at a designated spot within the next five days or she'd be kidnapped. She ignored the threat. A week later, it was repeated. Well, what did the police have to say about it? Miss Dawson didn't report it to them. Well, that was bright. Afraid of publicity, I, I'd imagine. Whereas if the kidnapping went through, she wouldn't get any, I suppose. Perhaps she'd made arrangements to have it done quietly, Lieutenant. Well, don't they kill you? What happened then? Well, even though she didn't take the authorities into her confidence, she had good sense enough to be frightened. That's why she's on this ship. Well, how do you mean? Miss Dawson felt that if she left Bermuda for a while, whoever was behind the kidnap threats would think she'd done so 
On the advice of the police and be scared off. Yeah, but wait a minute. If the Dawson girl is at such pains to keep her problem quiet, why does she suddenly dump it in your lap? I'm coming to that. Less than 30 minutes ago, she found uh, this note in her vanity case. She swears it wasn't there when we sailed. Oh. The price remains the same, but now it's pay up or else you won't leave this boat alive. Well, what's this about a white scarf? Oh, well, according to Miss Dawson, that was originally mentioned in the second threat she received by phone in Bermuda. The man told her to appear at a certain time in the Hamilton Post Office wearing a white scarf if she was ready to accept his terms. That would be the sign. <laughs> movies. Everybody goes to the movies. Now he wants her to wear it in the ship's salon tonight, any time between 10 and 12. Mm -hmm. Well, what do you make of it, Lieutenant? You asking me to come into this? I'd be very grateful. So would Miss Dawson. She and I went over the list very carefully, and you're the only passenger experienced in police work we could find. Well, what about your own men? Oh, the old thing. Everyone will know something is up, and that's what she's trying to avoid. Garbo. Uh, like that? You sure her name isn't Garbo? <laughs> Certain. Well, Lieutenant. Okay, where do I find her? State room 1270. I'll phone down and tell her you're coming. Either I hadn't been listening or else Captain Archer had purposely avoided describing Miss Dawson because for some reason or other it gets stuck in my head that she's mostly on the plain side. After all, who but a crow would pick the night of her coming out party to leave town? I keep on like this all the way down to her stateroom, and by the time she opens the door, I'm prepared for anything from Tugboat Annie to the Medusa. Good morning. Uh, uh is this 1270 stateroom? You're Lieutenant Cagle. Yes. Is Miss Dawson expecting you? I'm Miss Dawson. Won't you come in? Well, thanks. I'm Lieutenant Cape. Mm, Captain Archer phoned to say that you'd take the case. I don't know what the usual fee for a thing uh, like No, no, is. no, no, no. That's a private detective. This comes out of your taxes. I'm on the New York force. Oh, but surely no one expects I'm you. I'm not on vacation. Forget it. So let's talk about the note you received. Look, are you sure it couldn't have been put in your vanity case before you came aboard? Absolutely. You see, as soon as my luggage was brought here to the stateroom, I opened the case for a new lipstick... If the note were there, I couldn't have missed it. Is that the case, the small alligator job? Yes. Well, then what? Uh, I closed the vanity, although I didn't lock it, and left the stateroom. I wanted to watch us cast off. But up on deck, it was so crowded, I decided instead to go to the dining room and have some coffee. That was equally crowded, so I came back here and began unpacking. It was then that I... Found You've gone about 15 minutes. Oh, less. Ten. Mm -hmm. You know anyone on board? Yes, yeah, three people. Oh, rather two. Dr. Reed and his nurse, Miss Barber. Their patient, Mrs. Pritchett, is barely an acquaintance. Is Reed's stateroom far from here? Just on the companionway. But uh, before you say anything, Dr. Reed's out of the question. If during my eight years in Bermuda I made one friend, it would be he. Mm hmm the man was my doctor, father, counselor, just everything. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Reed knows you're on the ship. Oh, it was arranged that way. Uh, you see, about a month ago, Mrs. Pritchett, the patient I mentioned, lost her husband. The poor woman's been an invalid herself for years. Confined to a wheelchair most of the time. Eyesight failing. Well, she's over 80. Mm -hmm. So, Dr. Reed suggested that since she had no living relatives in Bermuda to look after her... She needs almost constant attention. It would be advisable to return to America and take up residence with her daughter's family. Mm, I see. Mrs. Pritchett agreed to do it, but only if Dr. Reed would see her safely there. You tell Reed about the phone call she got? Oh, no. When I found he was taking this ship, I simply pretended the idea of a visit to New York sounded interesting, and would he consider it an imposition if I tagged along? Okay. You've got no idea who might be behind this extortion thing? None. Well, what do you want to do about 
Oh, on protection, of course. Someone has threatened to kill me. And sure, that's... sure. Protection's all right, and you'll get that, but that's not the whole story. You've got to take a stand. Uh, you want to play along and smoke this bird out? Ignore him? Pay him off? Which is it? Oh, I certainly don't intend to pay him his cent. As for smoking him out, I hardly think he's worth the effort. Do you? Okay, you decide what to do. Well, simply this. We arrive in New York within 48 hours, and if during that time you'll protect me, with as little ceremony as possible, from whomever wrote that note, be he public enemy or pickpocket, I won't ask for anything else. You mean just hang around in the background like a bouncer? Or in the foreground like a traveling companion. I'm an easy person to get along with. Hmm. Well, when does it start? Right now, I guess. Uh-huh. Uh, maybe the dining room's not so crowded now. Uh, Helena. Mm-hmm. If um, it isn't, would you join me for a cup of coffee? Uh... Lou? Lou? Delighted. I'd be delighted. <laughs> The coffee takes about an hour. A very pleasant hour, by the way. And then Helena marches me into the lounge where we spend the morning playing Russian bank. During lunch, I ask if she'd mind my looking up Dr. Reed. Helena decides he may as well know what's going on now, since I'll have to be explained to him sooner or later anyway. So when the meal's over, I excuse myself and walk down to his stateroom. He's a very strange-looking guy, this Reed. Man about 60 with a head like a bowling ball. Skin, the color of an apple that's been bit into and left to stand for a while. I bring him up to date on what's happened, why I'm involved, and then he makes what you might think is a perfectly innocent statement. I lay the entire scheme at the feet of some ill-informed crank. Ten thousand (laughs) dollars. Helena doesn't have near that amount. Except that I didn't tell him the note demanded ten thousand dollars. I simply said a lot of money. Of course, you might have figured if folks could raise it with my love without much effort. I shouldn't wonder. What steps are you taking, Lieutenant? None. Miss Dawson doesn't want me to. Uh, excuse me, Lieutenant. That's Miss Barber. Uh, come in. Miss Barber, this is Lieutenant Cagle of the New York Police Department. How do you do? Pleased to meet you. Uh, doctor, Mrs. Pritchett's coming around. I thought uh, of maybe... Of course. Be along presently. Uh, you'll pardon me, Lieutenant. I dislike breaking off our conversation so abruptly, but my oh, patience... Get it. We can talk about this later. As you see, my time is restricted, but if in any way I can help or counsel you, I'd be only too glad. For years, Helena's been like a daughter to me. Yeah, that's what she said. Reed certainly put his foot in that one. I just hope the look on my face didn't give it back to him. Ten thousand dollars, huh? Probably been thinking $10,000 so much he can't even keep it out of his conversation. But normally at this point in any other case, I'd be telling myself what a hot rock Lou Cagle is when it comes to fast solutions. But now I had a problem in my hands. How was I going to tell Helena? After all, it's kind of a blow to find out the person who's supposed to be your closest friend is trying to shake you down for ten grand. So for the rest of the afternoon, every time the subject comes up, I move her along to a new one. After dinner, we kill most of the evening sitting around the ship's salon, and by 11 p.m. when they close, I've decided I can't put it off any longer. Helena says she'd like a cigarette before turning in, so we step outside and we stroll up the promenade deck. Uh, cool? Mm, just right. <laughs> I'll bet it's snowing in New York. Mm-hmm. Lou, look. What? A falling star. Yeah. Oh. That's pretty, huh? Did you make a wish? Uh-huh. Uh, Helena, how long have you known Dr. Reed? More than seven years. Why? Oh, I was wondering where he practiced before he came to Bermuda. No place. He's a native of the island. Reed was born there? Lou, are you cross-examining me? <laughs> Sorry. It's an occupational disease. <laughs> oh, I met Dr. Reed in, um, 1941, the winter. He nursed me through a case of the grip. And then when I got well and tried to pay him, he wouldn't take the money. How come? He knew how much a school teacher made. Pretty rough, huh? How did you taste so simple? $1,650 a year. 
Which, I imagine, went for cigarette. Oh, I lived on it. What's more, in two years, I'd saved enough to buy a second can car that I used to go around. Helena, look out. Get down. No, wait. Don't move. Hug the wall. It came from up in the boat deck. What? Stay here. Where are you going? The boat deck. Hug that wall and don't move. I'll be back in a minute. It was Reed. As he raised the gun, I'd caught a shadow in the hatchway above us. A head like a bowling ball. You couldn't miss it. I creep up the stairs fast, about two-thirds of the way... Then flatten down and heist myself forward till the deck spreads out just level with my eyes. It's deserted. And a little bit too quiet. Plus, that if the moon were any brighter, it'd blind me. I'm almost convinced there isn't a way in the world to get on that deck without being seen when I notice something. Stretched along the rail on my right are half a dozen lifeboats. And whenever the ship lists or rises out of a trough... The prow of the lifeboat nearest me throws up a shadow over the mouth of my hatchway. It lasts maybe four seconds, which is time enough to crawl to the rail and get down out of sight behind one of those boats if I'm quick. I haven't more than made up my mind to try it when the ship trembles again, dips to one side, hangs there a second, starts back, and now the lifeboat begins to spill its shadow across the hatchway. I hold off until I'm sure the shadow's almost as long as it's going to get, and then, with all the force I can, I... Throw myself toward the lifeboat. It's a typical jerk trick. I'm trying to rush up a 30-degree slope with everything else on board pulling the other way. Nijinsky at the top of his leap. If I were trying to get shot, I couldn't do a better job. But I finally do stop teetering back and forth and stumble behind the lifeboat. And by then, it's it's pretty clear that Dr. Reed has either gone to bed or put away his gun for the evening. A minute or so goes by while I catch my breath. And then suddenly, I hear the sound of voices floating up from the deck below me. And one of them's Helena's. But it's not until I crawl over to the hatchway that I find out who the other belongs to. I had to do the thing at this time. Furthermore, if I didn't come close, it wouldn't have looked authentic. Cagle's no fool. Maybe if they were inches from hitting us, what do you find? Don't excite yourself. It's over. You're unharmed. I'm surprised to be alive. Forget that precious neck of yours and keep your mind on the job. Will you do that for once? I'll be going now. Wouldn't do for him to find me here. No, it wouldn't. Call me in the morning. Good night. Good night, Doctor. It seems like ten years before I get to my feet and walk down the deck from that hatchway. I don't know. Everyone's in on this but me. But in on what? That question comes back again because Helena and Reed obviously have some brand new racket going, but... Like every other question of the jackpot variety, I can't answer it. Nor can I see how they expect to make any money by such monkey shines. Unless, of course, Helena is helping the doc shake a few thousand out of her old man by means of a phony extortion plot. Which reminds me that Helena is still waiting at the foot of the hatchway, or at least I think she is. But when I get down there, nobody's around. Back in my stateroom, I find a note slipped under the door in which she explains how terrifying it all was and that she couldn't bear another minute alone out in the dark and please call her first thing in the morning. <sighs> Looks like first thing in the morning is everybody's favorite time for contacting Cagle because about a quarter after seven along comes a steward with some more of Captain Archer's compliments and an invitation to eat breakfast with him in his cabin. Good morning, Lieutenant. Uh, good morning, Captain. I get you up? Uh-huh. I like your eggs. Fried, no, dropped, No, no, or... no, no. Coffee. Just just some coffee, please. Very well. Mr. Dawson found any more threatening letters in your baggage? Well, not that I know of. No cream, thanks. All right. Okay, uh, we uh, did get some action last night. Hmm? Gentleman who'd been hiding up on the boat deck fired two shots at us. Fired? Fired two? Kegel. It's okay. Please. He didn't hurt anybody. He didn't intend to. What? Man, in heaven's name, you should have reported it immediately. If I didn't know who he was, I would have. Well, did, did, now, look, Captain, you'd better go along with me on this. Take my word, he won't try it again. Also, please don't ask me who he is. The extortion notes are a blind for his real activity. And if he wants guesses we're even half onto him, you'll never see the bottom of this case. Hegel, this is most irregular. As the captain of the ship, I... I know, I know, you're responsible for the safety of your passengers. And that's exactly why things have to be kept quiet. Unless we really hustle, this bird might slide through without having a glove laid on him. As it stands now, I can't guess what he's up to, but I'll bet it's illegal. Uh, yes. What time do we dock tomorrow? Ten in the morning, New York time. Mm-hmm. 
What's use my planning any further? It was a nice dinner, I suppose. Dinner? Yeah, just a little thing. Last night out, stretching a custom. Well, perhaps you, Miss Dawson, possibly that doctor friend of hers might join me. Well, that sounds fine. Why call it off? Well, you have all the tension. There isn't any tension. Huh? Or at least, Captain, we shouldn't show it. I think your party's a good idea. For a fact? Sure. If you want me to, I'll issue the invitation. Good. Grant, I wish you would. Uh, eight o'clock this evening, my table. Come early. We'll have some cocktails. After leaving Captain Archer's cabin, I start down to the dining room when suddenly I remember that part in Helena's note about calling her first thing in the morning. I'm anxious to get moving anyhow, so even though it's pretty early, I go down and knock on her stateroom door. Oh, Lou. Come on inside. Uh, how'd you sleep? It's not very funny. Well, I didn't mean it to be. I'm sorry. It's just that all night I kept seeing Don't that. apologize. You've got good reason to be jumpy. Who was it? Did you see anyone uh, find anything out? Whoever shot at us was off the deck before I got up there. So what am I going to do? I'm afraid to leave the room. I'm afraid to stay in oh, it. I come just, on uh, now. Get a hold of yourself. It's broad daylight. No, it won't be broad di- daylight forever, Lou. I, I have, just you, to... have you what? had your breakfast yet? What? Breakfast. What's the matter? Aren't you hungry? Oh, no. <laughs> oh, you can't worry on an empty stomach. Come on. It was a good act, all around. And by the time we finish our grapefruit juice, Helena's appetite and confidence are on the upswing. And 20 minutes later, when we get up from the table, nothing will do but a stroll on deck. Well, more like it, hmm? A lot more. You know, that's the first pancake I've had in years. <laughs> you mean the first half dozen? Say, isn't that Dr. Reed way down there? Where? Near the lady in the wheelchair. Uh, no, no, out from the rail. Oh. Well, yes, it is. She the Mrs. Pritchett who's so sick? Uh-huh. It's odd, Miss Barbara. The nurse doesn't seem to be around. Somebody sitting on the other side of the wheelchair. Oh, oh that's she. I couldn't see her at first. Oh, Lou, before we get up to the... Don't say anything about last night, will you? Okay. All bundled up, isn't she? Who? The old lady. You can hardly see her face. What's the matter there, Fred? You'll catch a cold? <laughs> That, if she already has one. Good morning, Doctor. Helena, good morning. Morning, Lieutenant. Dr. Reed, Miss Barber. Good morning, sir. Morning, Miss Dawson. Uh, would you mind awfully if we continued our conversation a few feet away from my patient? She's had a very bad night. Just now dropped off in the slightest sound. No, no, Of course, we understand. Poor woman. I'm coming to regret ever having advised the trip. Uh, this'll do. We're far enough. What's wrong with her? Just now? A resurgent allergy. And she has dozens of them. I thought getting out of that stuffy cabin a bit might help. (laughs) It put her to sleep. That's something. Yes, I expect so. What about you, Helena? Nothing new. Eh, Doesn't surprise me. Crank notes. I'll wager the lieutenant's seen scads of them. A couple. By the way, we three are invited out for dinner tonight. Captain Archer. Everyone except? I love it. That's two of us. How about you, Doctor? Absolutely. We well, get excuse it. me, Doctor. Your patient says... Yeah, thank you. Uh, Miss Barber, uh, she's getting restless. Take her below, will you? Yes, Doctor. I-, I didn't notice. And here, give her a few sniffs of this menthol inhaler before she drops off again. Certainly. Thank you. Now, now, here we are. Just breathe in deeply. Deeply. That's the spirit. She's quieting down. Uh, fine. You'd best go back to the stateroom. I'll be with you directly. Can you forgive me? Uh, about this evening, tell Captain Archer I'll make every effort, but please explain the situation to him. Oh, of course we will. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye. Bye, Lieutenant. Uh, Doctor. Yes? You dropped something. I? You found it. Here. Why, so I did. Thank you, Lieutenant. Thanks very much. <laughs> At last, there's something. Maybe only half something, but anyhow, enough to move ahead with. It's late afternoon before I shake Helena long enough to start the machinery for cablegram to the chief of police, Hamilton Bermuda. 
And I'm still waiting for an answer at 7.15 when Captain Archer's farewell dinner party gets underway. <laughs> Dr. Reed managed to come after all, a break I intend to take advantage of, but quick. On uh, the third martini, he begins to lose that alert look of his, so I push back my chair, mutter a few excuses, and start out of the dining room. Crossing the mezzanine, I take a peek over my shoulder to see if the sudden exit provoked any comment from Reed or Helena. Well, apparently not. Both of them are having a big yuck over one of Captain Archer's ten-minute jokes, and he's getting ready to tell another, so it looks okay. Two minutes later, I'm standing in front of the door to Reed's stateroom, fingering a skeleton key. There's only one thing. The adjoining room, the one occupied by Miss Barber and the old lady, is connected to his by a door that may or may not be open. If it is, I'm a gone dog, but since I've come this far... Still in business. The door to Miss Barber's room is closed. There's a blade of light coming from under it, though, so I have to make the pussy feet. Now, where to begin? Reed's desk is the obvious place, but it's at the other end of the room. Therefore, out comes the pocket flashlight, which is a Lulu. It throws a beam all the length of a pop bottle. Somehow, I pick my way over to the desk, kneel down, and start easing the bottom drawer open. Pencils, cablegram blanks. Oh, the one above it doesn't even have the pencils. Ah, now here's the department. Stethoscope, thermometers. What's this? Uh huh. Home is the sailor. Uh oh, and that's from the corridor. Well, anyway, it's not Reed. He wouldn't knock at his own door. I barely snap off the flash and duck behind a chair when... It's Helena. She just stands there, peering through the half-open door into the darkness, listening. And then, as unexpectedly as she arrived, she's gone again. But not, I may as well face it, not before convincing herself that room was not empty. And since that puts everyone on to everyone, I'm afraid by the time I patch all this stuff together, Reed will have shot up half the boat. Well, at least I found what I came after. On my way back to the dining room, a steward hands me a cablegram, the reply from Bermuda, and it reads, According to best reports, Miss Helena Dawson checked aboard the liner Promethean yesterday morning, bound for New York City, signed... So-and-so, so-and-so, Chief of Police, Hamilton. It's the Promethean I'm on, so everything still gels. When I come up to the table, Captain Archer and Dr. Reed are in the middle of a long discussion on whether many, many seafaring men still suffer from malnutrition. But not Helena. Oh, Lou, we missed you. Where have you been? Oh, now, that's an unfair question. In the first place... Uh, Lieutenant, uh, you'd know something about this. I've been trying to explain to Dr. Reed here that... Feeding a crew of 40 of these. And that's how it goes for the rest of the evening. Back and forth. Helena working to pry me loose from anything she can. Captain Archer and Reed dragging me in to settle every argument they have. Around 10 o'clock, though, the wind begins to shift. Helena's managed to get it across to the doctor that there's something fishy about me. And the way the party breaks up would make your head swim. Uh, surely you'll have a night cap, Doctor. Uh, thank you, no, Captain. I just had mine. We early risers, you know. Miss Dawson, Lieutenant? I don't no, believe thank so. You thank you. Well, not at all, not at all. My pleasure. Anyway, I hope you uh, come to see me before we dock tomorrow. Yeah, we will. All right. Please drop in and say goodbye. We'll do that night, Captain. Uh, good night. Good night, Captain. Miss Dawson? Thank you for everything, Captain. It was lovely. Reed and I see Helena to her stateroom, and then we split up. By now, it's become a button-button thing. They know that I know, but they don't know I know that they know. <laughs> Which is involved, but I can't lay it out for you any better. Back in my own room, I start getting things ready for what I'm sure is going to happen within the next ten minutes. First of all, my bed. After I shut off the light, I rumple it up, jam the two pillows under the covers, and start shaping them to look like somebody lying there. Uh, no matter how I do it, they still come off like two pillows, but maybe in the dark it'll hold. Then I swing open one of the portholes that faces on deck 
and squat down directly below us. And for once in my life, I've called a turn. The square foot of rug under me isn't even warm when I hear somebody approaching on the deck outside. I count a slow 20 before I edge over and pick up the phone. Now, maybe this sounds porky, but if a ballistics expert can't turn the three slugs he'll dig out of my mattress into an attempted murder charge, I'll hand in my badge. Operator. Uh, connect me with Miss Dawson's stateroom, will you? 1270. One moment, please. I thought those footsteps sounded just a little bit too dainty to be Dr. Reed's. Sorry, the party doesn't answer, sir. Uh, that's okay. Put me through to Captain Archer's cabin, will you? One moment, please. Hello? Captain Archer? Yes? Lieutenant Cagle. We're about to go to work. Strap on your pistol. Huh? You've got the man who shot at you last night? I've got his number anyway. How soon can you round up a couple of men and come to stateroom 1265? That's your place? No, it's his. Why, right away. Immediately. Fine. I'll be inside when you get there, so don't bother to knock. I hang up, look down at the luminous dial on my wristwatch, and follow that second hand around for a full turn. Then I step out into the corridor and start to walk. Halfway to Reed's stateroom, a wrong thing begins growing up inside of me. Anger. Anger at the pretty face I went soft on that wound up trying to dish me a shroud. But an angry cop's no good to himself, so I work to shake it off. And I'm still working when the door to stateroom 1265 appears in front of me. And behind the door, I hear voices. Reed and Helena. Hello. Hello. You missed. Cagle, what's the meaning It's a shame to miss like that, isn't it, Helena? When you're so close, when you planned it so well. Lieutenant, you're drunk. What do you mean, barging in here? You'll tell me before I leave. You'll tell me what's behind please, everything. Please, there's something Your face is too straight. You bet there's something. Three shots and all into the bedclothes. Some waste. What huh? are you talking about? Here. Oh. A gun like this one. That's what I'm talking about. And if we all don't get down to some plain talk pretty soon, Lieutenant by... Cagle. You can beat me out of your head. In the name of heaven, Archer, have your men take this man. Don't you know who these people are? No, I don't, Captain, and the same goes for you. Shame. I came down here in good faith. I won't be made laughing, a laughing stock. That's right, you won't. I've got enough in this crowd to put him away for a long time. I warn you, Captain Archer, this drunken idiot... And if you'll quiet down, I'll tell you what it is. All right, Lieutenant, speak up, and it had better be good. If there aren't any objections... This I'll... is preposterous. Do I finish, Captain? Go on. The man who fired those two shots at Miss Dawson and me last night was Dr. Reed. Is that quite enough to convince you, Captain? No, I man? can't prove it. It's my word against his. But I did tell you this morning that I knew the man. Isn't that right? Lieutenant, what? I said he meant to miss us, didn't I? So you did, but... Have you noticed how quiet it's gotten around here all of a sudden? Uh, <laughs> well, in the first place, Dr. Reed and I have been friends for eight years. You said I seven years know. last night. You were friends in Bermuda, too. Wasn't that the story? All right, then tell me, how is it someone who's lived all that time on an island where they don't allow automobiles finds one to buy secondhand? While on you, where's the gun with the silencer you tried to use on me ten minutes ago? Gun? After all, Lieutenant. After now, plenty, you... Captain, you take a look at my mattress. It's got three bullet holes in it. And hell to put them there. No, I can't prove it. <laughs> well, then, Lieutenant, just what can you prove? Where's your patient? This is Pritchett. Captain Archer, this is the very Next last... Next door in the wheelchair? Lieutenant, I feel... Would you mind way. bringing her in? I most certainly would. I appeal to you, Captain. Yes, we've heard all this. She's over 80, eyesight failing, weak heart. Well, Lieutenant, if that's the case... It's why... not the case, Captain. She isn't 30, her eyesight's fine, and if there's anything wrong with her heart, you can blame these two. Oh, Lou, what's come over you Captain, tonight? when you ask one of your men to open that door? Cagle, who is it you expect to find in there? Look, you see this inhaler... It looks like the regulation menthol variety that people use for colds, doesn't it? Yeah. I took it from Reed's desk tonight. Here, smell it. Menthol? Why, that... Right, it's chloroform. He's been using it consistently on this woman that he calls Mrs. Pritchett for at least 38 hours. Now will you get that door open? Reynolds, open it up. Wheel her in, Miss Farber. The game's over. There you are. Look at it. Even with a gray wig and the makeup job, there's not much doubt, is there, Captain? But 
Who is she? Wake her up. She'll tell you. Captain, if you allow a hand to be laid on that woman, you'll... Yesterday morning, a young lady who claimed to be Helena Dawson came to your captain cabin and asked for police protection, didn't she? Why, of course. And then you both scoured the passenger list to see who qualified for such a job. In other words, you helped her find out how many cops were on board. That's all she wanted. An accurate count of the opposition. Turned out there was just one, me, and what a break that was for them. If I could be kept busy chasing wild geese, Reed here would be able to wheel his patient right off the ship without even lowering his head. But I don't Here's the see. way smart crooks work, Captain. An hour ago, the chief of police in Bermuda sent me a wire saying that Helena Dawson was on this ship. Which is just what everybody's been telling me. If I hadn't smelled that chloroform on deck this morning, the investigation would have stopped right there. Well, the chief was right. She is on this ship, but not the way he thought. Helena Dawson was kidnapped, drugged, and brought aboard on a wheelchair. That wheelchair. And if you don't believe me, wake her up. She knows her own name. Nurse, bring her in. Captain Archer, I'm warning you the consequence for such an... I'm prepared to accept them. Bring her too, nurse. Where? Don't please, more. Look, you're all right. It's okay now. Now listen, listen to me. Who are you? What's your name? Your name? Your name? What is it? Okay. Okay, Captain, there it is. Sure enough, there it was. A couple of phony names and wrong guesses, and a cop, any cop who happens to be standing downwind of your chloroform inhaler, and the next thing you know, everybody needs a lawyer. Even smart crooks. Crime on the Waterfront is written by J.T. Kelly and stars Myron Wallace as Lou Cagle. Listen again next week to another Crime on the Waterfront. This is George Stone speaking. Welcome back. Well, I like this series and the overall performance by Mike Wallace. A, a very interesting look at what might have been, uh, if not for the advent of uh, television, and his career taking an entirely uh, different, uh, different course. And, uh, writing was pretty good. Uh, like I, like I said in the first episode, uh, first, uh, episode, there was probably just way too many of these type of shows on, but I hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, well, next week, uh, we put it off for two weeks, but we're going to go ahead and bring you Pete Kelly's Blues starting next Tuesday. Uh, in the meanwhile, uh, send your comments to Box13 at GreatDetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives. And uh, give us a call at 208-991-4783. And uh, we will see you back here next Tuesday with Pete Kelly's Blues. And then join us uh, uh, again tomorrow for Let George Do It. Uh, in the meanwhile, from Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off. Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio from Boise, Idaho. This is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. Well, before we get started, uh, I do want to say our listener support campaign continues, and this is a listener support special. And uh, you can support the show on a one-time basis at support.greatdetectives.net. Our main focus on this 
episode will be on our Patreon program, patreon.greatdetectives.net, which is our monthly uh, recurring donation. And uh, the way that works is you pledge an amount, can be anything, $2 or more, and uh, we will uh, funds are deducted at the start of the month. Uh, and transferred uh, uh, to me. And there are a couple things we really like about the Patreon from the host perspective, and that is that it really uh, makes uh, produces some predictability because, uh, for example, last year we had a very low January and a very low April through June, and it really allows us to be able to look at doing some things to improve the show, particularly in regards to the server, because we, we're starting starting to get some high traffic and we definitely are going to need to upgrade the server which is going to be uh, an increase in monthly uh, expenses for the show. Uh, for those who uh, become Patreon supporters it's really simple because I know some people say you know I keep thinking about giving to the show and uh, with the Patreon it's just taken care of automatically and another thing that's nice is you don't have to uh, come up with a 20 or a 50 or a hundred dollar uh, donation. It's $2, $4, $7, $0.14, $15, $30 a month, whichever works uh, for you. And it's just taken care of automatically. I also do send a monthly uh, thank you letter just out to the Patreon supporters, giving them a little bit of heads up about some of the things we're going to be doing on the show. And that included uh, being able to help pick the, uh, getting first pick at the uh, listener support specials. And this is the second one that comes from a Patreon supporter. So again, check that out patreon.greatdetectives.net well uh, this week's request comes from Teresa for our second listener support request this one is very much on point with the detective genre unlike last week's where the request took us uh, another uh, place but uh, Teresa says I'm a fan of Broadway is my beat thanks for asking well thanks for requesting that Teresa I love uh, Broadway is my beat and um it uh, is really a very interesting show with a very uh, good uh, style of writing. Uh, it's written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin, two very fine uh, television writers who would distinguish them later on programs uh, such as uh, I Spy. This was their great radio, uh, and they do a fantastic job uh, writing it. Um, the show, the program actually began, uh, in, uh, being pr uh, produced in New York City in 1949, in the spring. Then in the summer of 1949, the series moved to Hollywood. And that, ironically, is where it stayed for the rest of its run. Elliot Lewis, who would become known as Mr. Radio, was the uh, producer. And really, his uh, talent as a uh, behind-the-mic creative force, uh, if anything, uh, excels his great work as a uh, as an actor. It ironically enough is probably one of the most uh, hard-boiled programs even though it focuses on a uh, police officer as opposed to a private eye. It's a challenge to do this series just because there are so many episodes of it. There are 169 episodes of Broadway is My Beat. So it's hard to find a good slice for that. The original uh, air date on this week's show is June the 23rd of 1950. And the title is The Steve Courtney Murder Case. <laughs> Broadway's My Beat, from Times Square to Columbus Circle. The gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. <laughs> There's a thing about Broadway, it mixes well with the sunlight. On a noonday of summertime, the concrete strikes silver glints, and the mob is nicely proportioned with silken ankles and dox hunts and wind-blown hairdos. And an organ grinder plays background music for the big grin and the clown's funny nose. 
At headquarters, I stood watching it, pushing away the time for the filling out of my routine reports. The diversions were down there in the streets, the girl and the yellow silk dress she wore, both knowing about summer and loving the feel of it. Then I heard two things. A sigh that came from me and a phone ringing that came from the phone. Danny Clover speaking. Did you do what I told you? Who is this? Did you do it, Mr. Clover? I don't understand. Who am I talking to? I wrote you a letter about Stephen Courtney. But Stephen Courtney's dead. Yes, I know he's dead. What's the matter with you? Everybody knows he's dead. What's your interest in Courtney? Who are you? Can't you see? It doesn't matter who I am. Can't you understand? Stephen Courtney... Hello. 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 (laughs) He was murdered. It started that way, the anonymous call, impossible to trace, the sifting through the dust of a man's death. Stephen Courtney's dying had for a moment upset the delicate balance of many worlds, a finance of corporate bodies, of dynasties in oil and steel, and the breeding of racing horses. The decay that for months had wasted his body had forced him finally down to the level of all old men who must die. The headlines wept, the commentators lamented. The memos came down from chairman of boards. There'd be a minute of silence for the death of Stephen Courtney. But now it was spoiled. Now a voice cried, murder. And the policeman must listen. In the records bureau, I found Stephen Courtney's death certificate. Cause of death, heart failure. Date of death, June 16th. Attending physician, Dr. Arthur Fulbright. In his office, Dr. Fulbright was poised, curious, and annoyed. Permit me to understand. You're questioning my diagnosis of the cause of Steve Courtney's death. We can put it that way if you want. And what do you base this sudden presumption? You have a right to know on a phone call. From whom? Another doctor? Some quack who wants to destroy my reputation? Chooses to degrade me by having me questioned by the police? It came from a woman. Who? She didn't say. All she said was Stephen Courtney was murdered. That's preposterous. Steve Courtney died last week as I had expected him to die, of a coronary disorder. He knew he would die of it, as I knew it, his family, his servants, his enterprises. But you'll fill me in, huh, Doctor, because I wasn't that privileged. Uh, the newspapers had it for months. How old Steve was bedridden. How he had chosen me as intimate friend to be his attending physician. How I kept him by sheer know-how from death's door. Still, he died. There are things in heaven and earth Yeah. That... Tell me about his dying. Normal. I had a call from his estate on Long Island. I canceled all other calls, went out there. Found old Steve lying sprawled on the floor, dead. Peacefully dead. You said he was bedridden. Why was he... Why was he on the floor? I confess the question occurred to me at the time, but then I rejected it. Like everything else, old Steve chose his own way of dying. Describe it to me exactly how you found it. I have. He was sprawled in the middle of the room. He had knocked over a radio on a... Hmm. That's strange. What is? The radio. Quite left explicit instructions. Nothing of the sort was to be in the room with him. Too exciting. Yeah, what do you know? Old Steve defied me. Yeah, I guess he did at that. Sometimes it slips out of our hands, doesn't it, Doctor? <laughs> It took about an hour to drive to Long Island in the estate of Stephen Courtney, and enough time driving through the estate to make an observation. The grass is always greener in a rich man's backyard, and plants that are only supposed to grow in the tropics will blossom on Long Island as long as they're nurtured by thumbs turned green by association with money. The plenipotentiary of the hibiscus beds told me he didn't know whether there was anyone in the house or not, but try at the track, he said. Yeah, the racetrack, way down there. Miss Lilla would probably be there. She always was. Then some more of the tour to the private track of the late Stephen Courtney. When I got there, the decor was still intact. A golden girl riding a black racing stallion. And a man leaning over the rails, holding a stopwatch. Uh, He did fine, Miss Lilla, just fine. Whoa, son prince. Steady, boy. Steady, that's the boy. Uh, How did he do, Joseph? Uh, 101 and two fists for the five furlongs. Uh, I'll help you down, Miss Lilly. All right. Who's your friend? Huh? Your friend? I didn't notice any... Hey, what are you doing here, mister? My name's Danny Clover. I didn't ask you that. Hi, Danny. Cool off, Sun Prince, Freddy. 
What can we do for you, Danny? I'm from the police. Fine. I'm Lilla Courtney. This is Joseph O'Donoghue, our trainer. How, How do you do, Mr. O'Donoghue? Uh, what's the police want with Miss Lilla? Joseph takes care of me. I see he does. The old man said I should. The old man said that, Miss Lilla. Joseph? The day he died. The next morning from that, his voice said to me, Joseph, you see that Miss Lilla is all right. When did my father tell you that? The morning after he died. Your daddy still talks to me. The way he always did. I'm glad. Things like that happened to Joseph, Mr. Clover. Once... Well... No, tell me about it. I once chartered a plane to take some people down to Baltimore last year's Preakness. Joseph said, don't go. A voice came to him while he was sleeping and said, tell Miss Lilla not to go. But I went. The plane crashed. I was the only one who came out of it alive. Even at that... Well, here, feel my knee, Danny. Well, uh... Go ahead, you'll see. The doctor said I'd be a cripple for life. Dr. Fulbright? Oh, you know him. We just met. Don't go back to him, Danny. I think he's incompetent. But he diagnosed your father's sickness as heart disease. I know. Oh, I... I suppose I'm being malicious. Of course, Daddy had trouble with his heart. Of course, Dr. Fulbright is competent. What about the radio in your father's room? What did you say, Danny? The radio. Your father wasn't supposed to have a radio in his room. He did on the day he died. He did? Now, I don't understand either. Why are you here? Why is a policeman asking me questions about Daddy? Call it routine. Don't talk to him, Miss Lilly. Joseph. I got a feeling about it. I say don't talk to him. Danny. Danny, I'm sorry. I've got to go now. There's some questions, Miss You'd better talk to my brother. He's around someplace. Try the house. I just can't talk to you, Danny. Admire our graveyard of dead animals? Oh, oh. yeah, quite a trophy room. <laughs> yes, that stuffed specimen you're looking at, Bengal tiger. Huh? Many brave souls lie asleep in the deep Hindu jungle, all because old Steve wanted to bring home a pussycat. Old Steve, your father? My father. Brandy? No, then your burl. Yep. Mother and I got along fine. But old Steve said the boy is hard to handle, so he called me Burl. <laughs> he thought that would make Mother angry, but Mother fooled him. She died a long time ago. <sighs> First of the day, it says here. You know who I am, why I'm here? No, oh, the domestic staff is agog with it. A woman called me. Said your father was murdered. Nah, it's a free country. They have the vote. They can say people were murdered, even my father. <sighs> Maybe it proves something. Like what? That the old man was human enough to die when someone killed him. I didn't know that about him. I thought he always picked his own time and place for everything. Then you think he died because he was ready to die. Hmm. What does it matter? He's dead and I'm rich. We're all rich. It'll be easier if you try to stay sober. <laughs> sober. When was that? All right, all right, I'll stay sober. You said you're all rich. Who? Lilla. I watched you from a window. An exciting thing, Lilla, wouldn't you say? Lilla. Who else? Yeah, you wouldn't say. Well, well, there's O'Donoghue. He got a big hunk. And the cook and the maids and the nurse. And a man at Iowa who shined my father's shoes once. The nurse. A who was she? Alice Barnett. Nursed the old man for years. It paid off. Where is she? Who knows? Old Steve dies, Nursie goes somewhere to cry. Leaves this nice, big, cozy mausoleum. No Nursie, anywhere. She lived here. Mm-hmm. Bed and board and street dresses. Who cares? We do. I'll phone headquarters to find her. Good hunting. O'Donoghue, the trainer, he told me your father talks to him even now. <laughs> My father. Joseph hears voices all the time. About a month ago, he had a three-way conversation with Orville and Wilbur Wright. There was a radio in your father's room when he died. How did it get there? You know, I wouldn't know. But he was dying. Surely you... I was a most unfilial son. Uh, look, why don't you ask Nursie when you find her? See, she knew about things like that. Yeah, you, you just ask Nursie. I uh, earned this, no? <laughs> Uh, 
welcome back to the doldrums, Danny. Huh? I was just leaving headquarters for the day. I thought it would be nice of me to welcome you back to them, the doldrums. What are you talking about, Detective? Well, Danny, since you have been cavorting with society and munching scones with the blue bloods, I wondered if you would be the same old Danny. And am I? Did you bring me a scone, Danny? Uh Uh-uh, no scones. Tell me one thing. What about the nurse, Alice Barnett? Did you find her? She is being as scarce as a... as a... You didn't find her, huh? As a... as a... Danny Clover speaking. You'd better get up here, Mr. Clover. Who is this? Burl! What's the trouble? It's your business to find out. Get up here. Somebody just got beaten to death. Over here! Over here! He's in there with... Get him out! Get him out! It was a design in horror, done in grotesques. The horse rearing, screaming, clawing its hoofs against the stall. The girl, disheveled, twisted with terror, pleading with him. Tia! Tia, leave him alone no more! Leave him alone, Tia! Burl, dazed, helpless, sodden with fright, with drunkenness. The blazing moon setting fire to the web of blood that reached out from under the stall gate. Tia, no more! Tia! Burl, help me! Help me get that horse out of there! I can't, I've been trying, I can't. Tia's a good girl. Help me! Help me! Uh, all right, don't, don't slap me anymore. All right. I'll open the gate, you grab her mane, come on. Joseph, poor dead Joseph, dead Joseph. What happened? <laughs> Lilla, what happened? I, I don't know. I was coming back from a moonlight ride. I heard Joseph scream. Tia was standing over him when I found him, trampling him with her hooves. I tried to pull her away. I called Bird. We, we tried. Tia must have kicked him. He, he fell, and then she... Till he died. <laughs> Tia. No, not like that, Burl. Joseph died because he was murdered. You are listening to Broadway's My Beat, written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin, and starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. Don't let a rainy day find you unprepared. Start saving for that rainy day right now by buying United States savings bonds. If you hold on to your bonds until they mature, you'll get back $4 for every $3 you invested. Buy United States savings bonds regularly. In June, Broadway bursts out all over. It lulls in the breezes of the air-conditioned movie. It compares postcards from the family in the Catskills. It drinks deep of the neon-scented summer air sighs and wishes mom and the kids would stay there because Broadway's having a wonderful time. Sixty girls, sixty will pass a given point at any given hour. The music drifting out of the Diamond Dance Pavilions is like partaking of an open-air band concert. And the drama on the front pages, a movie, a sheer, unadulterated drive-in movie. Consider, a tycoon dies, someone calls up, says it's murder. A horse trainer is kicked to death by a horse gone crazy with the moonlight. The police say it's murder. Where else but on Broadway can you spend a summer in such a way? And in the technical lab, a man in shirt sleeves wipes the sweat off his lips, breathes on a magnifying glass, wipes it on his pants, invites you to hold it to a photograph. Have a look, Mr. Clover. Uh, I suppose congratulations are in order. All because you made a lucky guess. Huh? (laughs) Come, come. It was only a guess, was it not? You're saying this Joseph O'Donoghue was murdered? Well, anyway, the photographs, my analysis, quite bear you out. They do? Oh, yes. This one in particular. See the back of the skull. It's quite plain on this one that O'Donoghue was beaten to death. But not by a horse. By a weapon to make it look like a horse. A horseshoe, I'll bet. But not of the type affected by thoroughbreds, by racehorses. More like one off a truck horse, or one that pulls a milk wagon. Ergo, 
Considering the circumstances, my view is the man was murdered by a human wielding a heavy horseshoe. He... <sighs> Technical. Con Reed speaking. Yes. Yes, he is here. Yes. Yes, I will tell him. Tell him. There is a woman waiting for you in your office, a Miss Alice Barnett. Lucky guess, huh, Mr. Clover? Yeah, I didn't even have a magnifying glass. Miss Barnett? Yes. We've been looking for you. Yes, I thought perhaps you were. I've come to give myself up. You're the one who called me, who told me Stephen Courtney had been murdered. Yes, I wrote you a letter, too. But there must be many things you want to ask me. There are. Why'd you hide? Because I was foolish. Because I was frightened. Because I, I, I don't really know. It's all mixed up. You see, Stephen and I were going to be married. Oh? As soon as he got well, it was all planned. It would have been exciting to be married to Stephen. Not for the money, just for Stephen. He was much older. Was he? I loved him. I didn't notice. I see. Why do you think he was murdered? Because it happened on my day off. Because I don't think he would have died if I'd been there. Where were you? In town, shopping, walking in the park, feeding the pigeons, in St. Patrick's for a while. It was quiet there, restful. But no place we can check. No, I don't think so. 